So to bring forth a birth of the human being back into the divine essence of reality itself. I want to keep stressing that Sat Chidananda is not just a human attainment. According to the way I've come to understand things, it's actually living in every creature. It's living in every dimension of experience. It's living in animate and inanimate, worldly and superworldly existences. So whatever this is that we can and must come to realize to regain our humanness, it's something that actually bridges the gap of all forms of otherness. It dissolves the sensation of being an other, a separate other, an other to oneself. In other words, seeing oneself and experiencing oneself as an object. What a hideous thought. And also, division of the world from the self. Another disturbing idea if it's something that you are actually going to be living in as a state of consciousness. But due to the negative forces and the anti-spiritualized forces in culture, we have a choice that can be made in terms of where we direct our attention in our life, what we are going to choose to explore, what seems most worthwhile. And so for me, I have found that through meditation for myself over many years, brought to the fullest possible level of experience, the best thing I can do at this point for the people that I associate with is to share this realization that is deep inside the heart. Share it as an actual taste, something you can taste, something you can enter into experientially, not intellectually. Reading about spiritual paths, about enlightenment and so on is auspicious, there's no doubt, simply because it educates the mind. It gives the mind sufficient material with which to proceed on its journey. But there's a more direct approach, and this is characteristic of the non-dualism that I do my best to embody and share with others. From heart to heart, from mind to mind, from inner self to inner self, reality can be shared. And in those areas that I enumerated at the beginning of my talk, specifically in the area of light, which is associated, to go a little deeper, with the ascension of attention, out of the small context of the waking state toward a more boundless area in one's own consciousness. That ascending process will awaken the subjectivity and allow it to begin to taste the light of the self. So through the activation of divine light, a human being begins to experience this boundarylessness in consciousness. And that's actually what I'm going to be sharing with you throughout this evening. I'm going to share the very rich texture of my own meditative experience over many years. And through osmosis, just through your own capability to listen and to be open and receptive I'm going to offer this to you. So I want you to pay very close attention to how your consciousness is during this time with me, to see if we are meeting in that way and in that dimension. Aside from the ascending potency of divine light, there is a very sacred idea that comes out of India which has to do with the feminine aspect of the divine, which is called the Shakti. Some people are familiar with that term here, probably most, if not all of you. Some people call it the Kundalini Shakti. Other people call it the Prana Shakti. It's essentially a vibratory current, an emanation from the same field 
that issues divine light. But it activates the human nervous system not toward ascension necessarily, but toward a higher bodily frequency of existence. So whereas the divine light aspect causes an ascension in attention and then a dissolution of ideas of separation, the Kundalini Shakti intensifies the natural electrical current, the bioelectrical current that courses through the body-mind. You already have proof of the activity and the presence of this current by the fact that your heart beats itself. Your cardiovascular system, your lymphatic system, all the various glandular systems in the body are operating inside this Kundalini Shakti current and they are doing so spontaneously because that current is a natural feature of your being. But what we're going to do here is we're going to jumpstart that and activate it so that it becomes more pronounced in your awareness along with the divine light aspect. So while the light will perform its action to dissolve duality, conceptual duality, the perception of separation and so on, and even the very idea of being an I, a separate sense of I, the Kundalini Shakti will work from another location to allow the bodily being to self-start, to generate its own intensity from within itself. The third aspect that I referred to was the devotional consciousness, which to me is very precious. Without having to devote yourself deliberately and outwardly to an actual object and have devotion to that object, I'm going to offer you a different kind of devotional experience that also wells up from the same location as the potency of divine light and from the activity of the Kundalini Shakti. Now this third element opens primarily the feeling center in the human being. The feeling center, we could call it the heart. Not necessarily the heart chakra specifically, although that might be included, but the entire dimension where you simply intuitively feel moment by moment in your daily activity. So this devotional element leads toward what is typically referred to in mystical traditions as divine intoxication, as falling in love with the beloved, and other things. So many lineages talk about it in so many ways. We couldn't possibly go into all of them this evening, so I just mentioned them. I just dropped those words out, hoping you can pick up and fill in the blanks on your own, since you might have some viewpoints that I'm not representing here this evening. But for me, these three main elements are the critical aspects of being a human slash divine being. And the capability, the capacity for non-dual experience can become, in my opinion, so pronounced that we really can become something analogous to a walking God on this earth. A walking, living, breathing, fully connected human being with the divine consciousness. And in a way that it's peculiarly powerful noticeable and transformative for everybody and everything. Naturally, the question comes up, what do I have to do? When we're talking about this level of spiritual experience and the fact that it is non-dualistic and monistic in nature, it's about detecting the grace that allows it to happen. It's more a discussion about grace than it is self-effort. And one further clarification, 
when I say grace, I don't necessarily mean a belief in grace or that you have to sort of, sort of invest your belief system heavily in a specific direction so that you then produce the result because that to me is a very indirect way at self-effort once again, which is something I want to bypass altogether if that's possible. I would like to use the medium of transmission, of transmitting from that fully awakened meditative consciousness of the absolute, these qualities which can be shared uninhibitedly and simply among all of us here without any previous background in meditation or any particular style of believing. So if something is that simple, if something is that potent, it seems to me that it's worth taking advantage of. It's worth at least giving it a chance to begin to activate all the natural spiritual circuitry inside your divine body-mind. Apart from professions and what you can learn relatively in this life, it seems to me these bodies were specifically designed to hook back up to the primordial consciousness of the universe and know it, and be it and feel it. So this is the offering that I humbly would like to give everyone a taste of and facilitate as much as possible through any possible obstacles that are present. I have found that there's really no obstacle that can prevent divine realization. The only obstacles that are there are the ones that you might imagine and invest in with an uninformed intelligence. Once you get proof to the contrary, once you get indication and a taste that reality is in fact inviting you into this realization moment by moment and that it's sort of leaping out of the ground of your own being right into your face, then you begin to realize that it's much more available than you imagined. But this precious connection is typically available. And with all due respect to traditions and lineages and organizations and religions and so on, from one human being to another. You can't package this sort of thing. It's like hearing something firsthand from a source. Someone's gonna tell you a secret. This secret has never been told to anyone before. This person is going to tell you this secret just because this person loves you. And so when you hear this secret, you've never heard anything like it before. And in that sense, it can't be prepackaged. You can't have an envelope with the secret written on it and then give it to everyone. But you can emanate the feeling of it because we're all human beings, we're all of the same species. Our body minds naturally take toward receiving this from another human being. So without posing myself as any spiritual authority, I just want to say that it's possible to taste something in innocence and with childlike simplicity and be completely elevated by it in an instant. And if you're attentive to that instant, that instant can remodel your whole psyche, your whole life if you actually allow yourself to recognize it, that is, put aside everything you think you know. And that's not so easy because we read so many books, we collect so much information, we begin to consider ourselves geniuses and experts. But around the divine, there's only one expert, and it's not you. There's only one expert intelligence, nor is it not you, you see, it's very tricky. Certainly one doesn't want to claim ownership of divine consciousness, but one should not dissociate ownership either. So this is a very interesting paradox and a very delightful uh, ambiguity to enter into. Since what we're coming to terms with essentially are our own tendencies either toward 
self-aggrandizement or self-hate. You see, so someone to me who wants God just to be out there, just out there, that's a form of self-hate in my vocabulary, my spiritual vocabulary. And someone who just wants God to be them is obviously a bit inflated, a bit selfish in their inflation. But if God is both the self and everything that is considered to be the non-self, it must be a total erasure of any kind of limited or arrogant, subtle feeling in the heart. And that's really where all of this goes, where this river flows is toward a nameless, spotless, stainless, indescribable condition of being that can only be lived by allowing the fullness of grace, the light, the love, and the energy within grace to operate fully and completely inside of a life. So again, this is what I'm offering as to what this is going to look like it's going to look like as many faces as there are in this room. It's going to take on a unique form in each person. So it's important to understand the non-regimented basis for this realization. It's not about coming into line with some authoritarian understanding of spirituality. It's about actually freeing your mind from every form of bondage and operating and relying solely upon divine intelligence moment by moment. And so I'm here to sit and enjoy this extremely precious moment with you this evening, this moment that will never be again. This fraction of a moment will never be again. And so in that sense, we should be very hungry just to be open in something that is disappearing right before our eyes. expansion feeling in my forehead and then I became kind of intoxicated. There was this feeling of love and intoxication that just took over. Very blissful. Anyone else? I got really warm, really warm. Starts sweating. There's a lot of activity in the crown chakra. Are you feeling some bliss? It's feeling pretty good, yeah. It's moving in that direction. That's typically what follows that opening. That's the ascension process that I was describing. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, sir. Of emptiness. I'm sorry, can you? Of the experiences of just being emptiness, being just nothing. Just being nothing? And the mind comes and goes, comes and goes, but it's just the witness, the long space. Fantastic. Throughout the day, it's been happening, and then here it's Good, let's keep opening that up. It's great. Yes. Unbearably blissful, Shakti. <laughs> Unbearably blissful. Wow. Fantastic. Yes. Um the I had the usual expansion of heart and then I heard a word, transducer. 
I'm not going to take responsibility for that one. It must mean something to you on a deep level if you look into it. I'm sure you'll find the meaning. Yes. I experienced purple ball at the third eye. Oh, I forgot to mention that. So there's. Let me let me comment on that. What she said was she experienced a purple ball in the area of the third eye while her eyes were closed meditating. So in addition to divine light, divine love, and kundalini shakti, there's a fourth modality. I discuss it in my books. It's called the multidimensional lights in consciousness. Those lights appear typically in meditation while you're sitting with me, and they can open up a series of colors in the forehead area, which you perceive internally. And those colors have different vibratory qualities, different areas in the human being and beyond the human being that they address from pure white, brilliant light to golden, all the way down to very dark and deep purples and so on and everything in between. So that is an experience that many people do have in these meditations. I just want to confirm that for you. I'm sorry for leaving that out earlier. I feel really peaceful there. Yeah. But then sometimes I can't hold on to it. Yes, so the typical posture uh, to deal with that is just observe your own grasping. In other words, that tendency to not want something to leave is a form of fear. You're being stroked by this beautiful experience. You don't want it to end. And then when it ends, you feel a little sad. But it's through the gaining and losing of these experiences that they learn to abide inside of you all the time. They must leave. But the good news is that they get better and better. And each time we're together, a new unfolding will happen for you. So you'll forget the past. And things typically just get deeper and richer in many ways. Anyone else? Yes. There's all kinds of things happening, but among them, for a time, my whole breath was not me breathing. It was very deep and it moved deep and down and around and then around. It just it had its own a life of its own. It was incredible. What else happened? You said many things happened. Can uh, you say a few more things? Not to say that wasn't a, a nice just, experience. Uh, love and expansion wonderful in, in the most you know breathtaking yes stop breathing a few times beautiful ways um an incredible glowing you're seeing light is anyone seeing light in the room actual light manifesting in the room i don't mean these lights <laughs> Just a, uh, some people are seeing some light that's very common actually you're beginning to see it, even with your naked eyes. Well, it felt like I was inside a flashlight beam or a... Yes. You know, that I was like... You're, see, you're already light. living inside the holy of all holies. Now you're going to begin to see it. It can get very quiet where you don't notice that. But to bring it up like this into an experience re-educates you and puts you in a revived condition a new spiritual condition, and this will typically get better and better. So then, within that... Yes, go ahead. ...was a, um, you know, in that profound love, forgiveness space, there is a person, and the reason I'm in town, that those around me and parts of my other selves, my hurt child, she represents, pain spaces and is physically in a place where my father died. So this woman is like a real manifestation of so many metaphors. But the point what happened is uh, that this prof I was just sending her love and light and this is someone who does not live by that at all. And instead it was just a major shift 
and the whole paradigm of this situation of sending the aspect of her who's crying for love and forgiveness and just talking with that aspect. And it was so beautiful of forgiveness. And this is your time. You can do the right thing out of the shred of you that has this pearl of love that's hungry. It just and it was just encompassing that that aspect of the most highest love, and that's when it was the most bright. And then and then there was this whoosh, whoosh right out of me. So clearly those are my own aspects. It just it's it's wordless. I can't even describe it. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for trying. Any questions? Can you tell us your understanding of ascension and the ascension process of Earth? The way I use that term has a great range of meaning. Ascension can also manifest as descension, the dissension of attention, as in meditation, as in good meditation into nothingness, into just empty being. And on the other hand, it can give rise to the experience of pure light. So there's that whole range present within the idea of ascension of attention. But it gets a little more complex because even when I talk about the Kundalini Shakti, which is essentially a vibratory force, that also can go up the chakra system and out of the head, or it can drop down and bring you into embodiment. So there too, there's a full range of meaning on the level of energy. So on the level of divine light, it can go from light to radiant nothingness or even dark nothingness. With Kundalini Shakti, it goes from extremely high vibratory current to again, a dropping of attention just into the whole mass of the body, the physical flesh. And by the way, this is how the flesh becomes divine. There are certain spiritual traditions, if you've ever studied the works of Sri Aurobindo, for example, who lived in India about a hundred years ago. He discussed the divinization of the flesh 
that these bodies are not just corporeal, not just solid, heavy, dense, and geared towards suffering, but through enough spiritual illumination can become intensely occupied by light. So this whole range of experience from density to vibratory, from light to dark nothingness, and of course from love, from the heights of love, which is union, to the depth of what seems to be non-love, which is emptiness in the sense of emotional emptiness, that range is all so present in a human being. So even to address your earlier question, my teaching is not that we should just stay in one place all the time, as though we can ascend and stay fixed. I do understand the deeper question you're asking about the movement of the human race. Where are, are we going as a planet? Maybe I can get to that. First, let me address these things. That for me, spiritual realization actually has a deep understanding of suffering in it as well, so we can continue to work with others on the path. So if you were to get just fixed into a condition of permanent light realization or you could stay permanently ascended, it would be great for you, but it would lead toward a monastic style lifestyle. And in our society, even though we should pursue that sort of lifestyle to some degree, it's not going to actually make realization any more intense than if we are able to act and help others at the same time. So compassion becomes a really important word here. Along with full realization comes the possibility to still identify with the suffering of other people. And to do that, you have to leave yourself vulnerable to the total range of experience. Otherwise, you're just going to shut the door and say, I just want to stay in this sort of exalted, illumined condition. And that, from a spiritual point of view, in my opinion, is not the optimal or even the ultimate state. The ultimate state is where you can begin mirroring other people's lives right back to them, and you can actually even embody everything moment by moment to some extent. So as far as the human race goes, I don't know what to say about that. Um, I don't consider myself a pessimist or an optimist. I just try to look at what's real, what's really happening. And there's a lot happening. And to try to understand it all is a bit contradictory because you see some very positive things happening right now on the planet. And you see an awful lot of negative things, maybe more negative than positive. I know it depends on where you look, but if you define reality on where you look and that your looking creates the reality, that's just a form of subjective idealism. And that's not ultimately insightful. If reality is nothing but what you create in your own mind, then you just live in a, essentially a self-created reality. So yes, I do believe that there is a world out there I do believe that consciousness impacts that world. I do believe there's an evolutionary process going on. But these are very deep questions, and maybe we can go into them on some other evenings because it opens up some very long discussions. Yeah, in the context, though, because I'm not an intellectual, I'm not an academic, I'm a mystic. I'm someone who's talking from a different area of reality and trying to share that with you. I'll do it in a way where it's connected to what's happening in this room so that experientially your life can become enhanced by the knowledge and the experience of being here. I hope that, I hope that this is what can be facilitated. It's my very powerful intention is to come and see all of you enjoy something that is very precious, really mind-blowing. Once you get a good taste of it, you'll never be the same. And all you need is just a second of it. It doesn't have to go on and on. You will go on and on, but you don't need to actually maintain it in the way that your mind understands what the word maintain means. It's more like 
surrender. It's like that you've surrendered all of your selfishness spontaneously. And therefore that hugeness can just be there with you. But selfishness is not a bad thing. I'm not a moralist, so don't worry about that. I'm not, I'm not a moralist. That, that's out. Mystics and moralists have never occupied the same space. The deeper your experience gets in the spiritual realm, the more idiosyncratic your understanding of existence will become, and the more deep it will become. So really, you're the whole universe in that body, so we're waiting to hear from you on that point. See, we're, it's, it, this is what makes this so much fun, is that everyone is really an essential part of this. There's really no teacher and no student. It's that you become this fully in yourself. I'm just going to try to open doors up here and provide the frequencies and energies for this to happen. But as far as how this happens and what the result is, you, you're going to look like that result. And I don't know what that looks like. And that's why I have a hard time predicting where the world is going to go. Even if I could engage in my most blessed fantasy as to how I would like things to work out, I know it's not going to be that way. Yes. What I find interesting is that if I can go deeply within and touch the essence of what it is to be a part of creation and then bring that to my wakeful world, then I feel it has presence and it has purpose and it has meaning. But for myself, if I go within and I only reside within, and I don't bring all that I am within out into the world, what purpose do I serve? That's a very good question and a very profound observation. But if I might add something, just as a way of comment, that your expectation that it become purposeful might in fact become an obstruction to it actually taking its natural course into the world simply because you might have some expectations as to what that might look like. Mm. An affirmative feeling about what you're saying, that yes, it must blossom, this fragrance must come out, it can't just stay inside. One still must be cautious around ideas of results and utilitarian notions of proving to yourself that things have really happened, because the divine is very paradoxical. Mm. Because if you think one way, it's going to teach you not to think that way. It's going to take away from you your self-assertive nature of thinking and give you this other largesse, this gigantic sense of generosity that goes way beyond what you think goodness looks like, what help for another looks like, what a peaceful world looks like, and so on. So I've learned over many years that my mind is very good to bring me toward a particular direction, but I never follow it. The mind is very good up to a certain point, but then once it gets really close to the divine, it implodes because it can't bear the light. It becomes an empty vessel. And so in that emptiness, then automatically you are radiating this grace to others, even when you think you're not. Even when you think you're not. Even when you think you're the farthest away from the center, from the essence, from the holiness, whatever you want to call it, the divine being. Even during those moments, you are still completely there. And somehow to learn to accept this full range of light versus darkness is the total state, and that's where I want to move with this. And it does require faith, a kind of faith that life is going to be kind to you, that life is going to give you what you want, even as you're walking into this blind, in a sense. It's beautiful. The energy is beautiful now. Do you feel it? You feel what's happening? It's really beautiful.
this is osmosis now. This is when we're actually sharing a similar reality that really has no words to it. It has no literal description, but the part of your being that just feels, feels it. And so watch how sacred your own being is. This is what's so incredible is that the closer you get to this, the more profound the transformation into it. It just depends on what you want, what you're after in life. If you want to get really, really close to this, you just dive in completely. You don't want to get close anymore. You just want to splash. You want to get inside the ocean. You don't just want to wet your feet. We've been told by the authorities not to expect too much in this way. They've got everything outlined so there's no mystery left. And I'm telling you there's only mystery. <laughs> and if you can live in that mystery, it'll become a huge release. It doesn't mean you'll never suffer again. It means that you will have undergone a total transformation in your consciousness, which cannot be undone. Even death will not touch this. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Because death happens in the waking state. And once you're sufficiently moved out of this little area of the head that we call the me, once you've moved into the space of the heart, you become consciously immortal. You actually become eternal. You're in that river. You're in that river that leads to the ocean. So eventually that river is going to send you right down to the mouth where the union between the river and the ocean happens. And that's where you disappear. That's where you become the ocean. And until that moment, you won't really be happy. You won't even be happy as a human being. Even if you have the best cars and you've got the best house, there'll always be an empty place. But when the river meets the ocean, there's an explosion into the totality. And what happens at that moment goes on happening for eternity. I know I'm pushing the limits now. We're really pushing right to the edge here of what the message is. But if you've got the time, if you've got the interest, if you've got the motivation, then I'll walk this with you. But if you don't, then maybe there's another teaching for you. And that's just as beautiful. If this teaching doesn't make total sense to you, there's no hard feelings. I just open this up and offer it. It's just an offering, like a flower. It opens, and then the bees are given the offering. If the bees come, fine. If the bees don't come, the flower will open the next day and keep on opening. So the nectarous bliss of the self comes out of the flower of the heart. We drink it, we become intoxicated by it, we become nourished by it, transformed and ultimately turned into God. We become turned into that which we worship. We become that, the supreme consciousness. Questions, concerns, experiences, comments, observations. Yes, please. Can you tell us more about your background of awakening to spirituality and where yes. you were at and why you chose to go to India and study? I actually did not go to India. The teachers that I studied with were all Indian but they made their teachings available in this country. And I essentially practiced an East Indian and 
Vedic style meditation for many years, for decades. And during that time, I had some remarkable things happen. And then in 1996, I had a meditation out in Palm Springs, California. I write about it on my website, where the meditation went into non-return. It went into a state where meditation itself became unnecessary after that, you could say. It became fulfilled. And not long after that, I experienced the waves of the Shakti coming so that I knew I could offer this to other people. And that's when I began my teaching work sometime in 1998 in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I've been doing this for about 19 years, very quietly. I don't do much advertising because I just like working with a few individuals. Um, and I quite what frankly... What are the weights of the Shakti line? Well, you're going to be telling me. Is it electrical yeah, feeling? Yeah, it's blissful current expansion in the body and in con Who's experiencing the Shakti tonight? Anyone? Yeah. So it's your taste that matters. It's essentially a dynamic current of vibratory bliss that takes the body into that ascended state and also opens the heart. It works on many levels. And the deeper you receive it, the more transformed your body becomes. Because, you know, your body has to change to adjust to these very high states of consciousness. And so you need an upsurge in frequency so that your mind can stay in that elevated condition. And the Shakti helps accomplish that. The Shakti helps to nurture and coax the body-mind into accepting the divine in a way where it can feel it, where it can register its presence, and then live in it day by day. So the Shakti is very, very important. But let's just say that my own process lasted decades, a lot of meditation, a lot of guidance. I saw a couple of teachers. I don't actually mention their names because I'm not endorsed by them. And so I keep a respectful distance between myself and my spiritual sources because they are their own teachers and they're doing their thing and I'm doing my thing. And I don't think it's fair or even welcome to try to establish a relationship by saying, I walked down this path. Let your time with me be the proof of whether something is real here or not. I'd rather just appeal to your experience. <laughs> if I can't come in and offer you this directly without any suggestion toward an outer authority, then I really shouldn't be doing this. Besides, I just love forming direct relationships with people. It's my joy to connect with all of you, to, with you and others, in a way where you begin to see me for who I am, and then you'll see that you're seeing yourself at the same time. This has been a wonderful group, by the way. I've enjoyed having all of you here this evening. And Thanks so much for offering your comments. Your comments are so vitally important as to how this unfolds because what you say can be much more important even than what I say. Someone on that side of the room or that side of the room, when you speak, you might help that person because you may address a concern from your own viewpoint, from your viewpoint that I will not see. So you make this a rich evening. I'll do the best I can, but I'm glad you've come forward and offered some uh, heartfelt participation. Privilege. Namaste.